Hi, today we're going to be discussing behaviorism, which is our first educational psychology theory. And behaviorism really forms the foundation for many of the other theories we'll talk about this semester. So while it's pretty limited in scope, it is really important for the rest of our discussions this semester. So when we talk about behaviorism, um, our guiding questions today will be, what does the con what constructs um, does behaviorism entail? And what are the relationships between those constructs? So our big idea with behaviorism is really that learning is changes in behavior. So when we're thinking about what learning means to a behaviorist, we're thinking learning is simply a change in behavior. So it's observable, learning happens as something that we can see. So that what constitutes a behavioral approach, um, it really includes both classical and operant conditioning. So it's important that we understand the difference between classical and operant conditioning, which we'll discuss a lot today in this lecture. There's many videos. It'll also be a part of your reading this week. So what makes a theory behavioral? Um, it assumes that the outcome of learning is observable. So if we really think even with our accreditation and um, accountability measures we have in schools today, we're really we're not thinking about learning as something that happens internally in a child's head or in their brains. It's something that we can see. Learning happens when we see it on a test score. It's observable. That's a very behaviorist approach to learning. Um, the thoughts that we have are merely words, um, and those words that are uttered are behaviors. So thoughts are behaviors in the sense that they're words that um, we could see. Um, and learning is really um, shaped by our environment. So a strict behaviorist um, is someone who thinks that learning only happens because of our environmental circumstances, that everything that shapes a person and who you are is because of your environment. We're, if we think about that nature versus nurture debate, we're way on the side of nature here, right? Um, so when we think about classical conditioning, which is the first um, step in behaviorism, the first theory, the first approach to learning, we're thinking about um, Pavlov and Watson are the two main theorists here, so you should definitely associate their names, Pavlov and Watson, with classical conditioning. So here's a quote from Watson, um, and this really sums up this behaviorist approach. Give me a dozen healthy infants, well-formed, and in my own specified world, bring, for, to bring them up in, and I'll guarantee to make anyone at random and train him to be any type of specialist. I might select a doctor, a lawyer, an artist, a merchant in chief, and yes, even a beggar man and a thief. Regardless of his talents, um, tendencies, abilities, or vocations, and race of his ancestors. So Watson's really saying, I can shape who a person becomes is because of their environment and I can shape that based upon the environments that I give them. So there's a video in your lab about the little Albert experiment. This was Skinner. And basically what he did is he, he there's this baby, a little Albert, and he presented Albert with all these toys that he liked, these stuffed animals, soft things, and Albert was happy, right? Yay. Happy, sweet, you know, rabbits and you know stuffed animals. And then when he would give Albert a soft animal, he would associate it with a really loud noise that scared Albert. So then Albert came to associate that toy with that loud noise that scared him. And then um, little Albert was now afraid of those soft animals and toys that he previously liked. So we can see that now he, um, what Skinner did was he, he made the kid afraid of things that he wasn't necessarily afraid of before. And he shaped the way that this child viewed the world. Um, so, you know, basically scaring young children, right? Lovely, right? Just the kind of thing we want to do in education. But the point here is that we can shape, based upon our environments and our experiences, we can shape the way that kids view and learn. So, um, and we can see a really good example of this and more explanation of this in the YouTube video in the Canvas course. So classical conditioning um, occurs when there's a neutral object that comes to elicit a specific response and this response may be unique to the individual. Um, and it occurs via an association of that neutral object with a meaningful stimulus. So we have, um, yeah. So in classical conditioning, this is happening um, when the neutral st stimulus is happening at the same time as the behavior. So we're associating those two things together at the same time. And that's the key to classical conditioning at the same time. So some terms here we have. 
um, the unconditioned stimulus, that's the loud banging, um, and the unconditioned response is what happens when you when you when you hear that. So in the little Albert experiments, that loud banging um, created fear or startle a flinch, right? That wasn't anything that Skinner made Albert feel in the experiment. That's just automatically what happened, right? So if I see ice cream, I'm automatically happy. No one had to train me to be happy about ice cream. I am just happy about ice cream, right? Then there's some sort of neutral experience. So in the little Albert experiment, it was the white rabbit, right? The stuffed animal, the thing that made him happy. Um, he associated that with something um, that he loved, right? But um, that, or that he, or it didn't have a response at first, right? Something that was there. Then when, when um, Skinner paired that white rabbit with the unconditioned stimulus, um, the loud banging, so that then it, then that white rabbit became associated with something. Then it became conditioned, right? It became conditioned with the loud banging. Then whenever Albert saw the white rabbit, it was he got that conditioned response, that fear, that startle, right? So if we think about the ice cream truck, listening to the music, the ice cream truck music, without any associations, that music means nothing, right? But because I've grown up in a world where I hear the ice cream truck music and it, I know there's ice cream coming, that music makes me happy, right? That's a conditioned stimulus because of my environment. And now that happiness I feel when I see the music, that's my conditioned response. That makes sense? So think about these terms and we'll go through another example. So stages of classical conditioning. We'll think about another really classic experiment, Pavlov's dogs. So in this experiment, um, Pavlov um, has these dogs, right? And there's a really great YouTube video again where they've recreated this experiment. But let's go through it again just so you can understand classical conditioning. So um, the unconditioned stimulus here in Pavlov dog's experiment is, um, is um, the, uh, the unconditioned response. So think about what the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the neutral stimulus, the conditioned stimulus, and the conditioned response as I explain the experiment to you. So what happened was um, Pavlov had these dogs. He was really interested why dogs were salivating all the time, um, especially when he brought them food. So he noticed that when he brought the dogs food, they salivated more. They, you know, it was a, um, when they were hungry, right? He brought them food, they salivated, right? So then he started ringing a bell every time he brought them food. So um, ring the bell, bring the food, the dogs salivate, right? And then he noticed that when he rang the bell, even if he didn't bring them food, the dog still salivated. Okay, so that's the Pavlov dog experiment. So think about what was the unconditioned stimulus? Okay, so the dog food, right? That, that he would bring the dog food and he didn't have to train them to do anything with the dog food, right? As soon as the response there is always salivation. He didn't have to train them to salivate when he saw the food, right? The dogs just automatically are hungry with the food, right? And what was the neutral stimulus in the beginning or what was the thing that doesn't necessarily elicit a response with the dog? Yeah, right, the bell, right? Before the experiment, ringing a bell for a dog didn't wouldn't have produced any kind of response, right? And then once he associated the bell with the dog food, right, then the bell became the conditioned stimulus. And then what was that conditioned response at the end? It was a salivation, right? Even when there was no food, the dog still salivated. Um, Food. So think about that. Be sure that you could rename all of those parts for any kind of classical conditioning. So think about your life and how you might have been classically conditioned. And I have two pictures here um, from, from TV shows that you might remember. Um, if you've ever watched The Office, there's a classic episode where every time um, Dwight's computer boots up and you hear the Windows you know, chime, um, Jim gives Dwight a mint, right? And so then all of a sudden, um, you know, this goes on for a couple of weeks and then um, Dwight's computer is rebooting and he's like, man, I am so, my throat is so dry, I just really need a mint right now. So, so Jim has classically conditioned um, Dwight to need a mint, right? And there's another example um, where 
Sheldon in Big Bang Theory has classically conditioned um, Penny about chocolates and trying to train her to not sit in his chair, I think. So we, we see examples in TV shows where they use classical conditioning to maybe change the behaviors of people. Um, are there examples when we have class, when you have been classically conditioned? Um, and can we use, can we use this to help ourselves and to train ourselves to do things? Um, so, um, I would like you to share your examples. I'm going to put up a, I'm going to try, attempt to put up a, a quiz here inside this lecture to see if you can answer this um, as just a formative assessment to interact with this lecture. So think about classical conditioning. If you need to pause the, um, the lecture right now to see, that'd be great. Okay, now let's move on to operant conditioning. When we think about operant conditioning, we're really thinking about um, Skinner. This picture of um, handsome B.F. Skinner here. And um, he thinks about behavior and how it's influenced by the consequences, by the things that happen after the behavior, the antecedents. And um, we think about these terms, we think about behavior, and we'll talk about reinforcements and punishments reinforcement schedules and extinction. So these are going to be the big constructs in operant conditioning. So think about reinforcements and punishments here. And this is where these terms, I always have to sit back and think about when I go over these terms um, in this class. So don't feel like this is something that you should already know, but know that it's important that we get these terms right. So reinforcement is something that increases a behavior. So we, when we want to increase a behavior, we have a reinforcement. And positive reinforcement, we hear a lot about, it's the most powerful way to change behavior um, in an, under a behaviorist framework. And so positive reinforcement is when we get rewards or positive feedback, right? So if every time a student answers a question right, I give them a piece of candy, that is positive reinforcement. I'm increasing the behavior of answering the question correctly with, with a reward, right? We all we understand positive reinforcement. That one's pretty straightforward. Negative reinforcement is so it's still reinforcement. Reinforcement means we're increasing the behavior. So we're increasing the behavior by doing something negative by removing something. So the negative means removing. The reinforcement means increasing. So if I want to increase the behavior of answering students and of having students answer questions correctly, I could remove a discomfort. So for example, if students answer questions correctly in class, I could remove their homework. That's a discomfort, right? So um, if I want to increase people wearing their seatbelts, I can decrease the discomfort of that ding noise that happens in the car when you, when you don't have your seatbelt on, right? So that's negative reinforcement. I'm, removing a discomfort. Make sense? Okay. Then we have punishments. Punishments decrease that behavior. So a presentation punishment is when we when we reprimand some, someone's behavior to get them to stop. So if I want to stop a kid from running and I shout at them and say, stop running, then that's a punishment, right? If I um, you know, if I give a kid an electrical shock so that they stop sucking their thumb, that would be a presentation punishment. Also, don't do that. That's terrible, right? We don't want to abuse kids. So, um, a negative punishment is removing something that they like in order to decrease the behavior. So, if a kid is running in the hallway and so I tell them that they cannot play at recess, I've removed something they like, which is... Um, playing at recess um, to decrease the behavior of running in the hallway. So keep it straight, reinforcement increases behavior, punishment decreases behavior. Positive things are things that we do, that we, that we present, that we do. Negative are things that we take away. Um, and so remember that in operant conditioning, as opposed to classical conditioning, the reinforcement or punishment or intervention is happening after the behavior occurs. So in classical conditioning, remember that stimulus was happening at the same time, we were associating two things at the same time. Um, in operant conditioning, that reward or punishment is happening after the fact. It's a consequence of their behavior. So here's another graph that maybe also helps explain our um, 
the pot the punishments and rewards and presentations and all of that so we've got contingencies that's if we present or remove something we have the positive reinforcers and the adverse averse stimulus so we have positive reinforcement punishment negative punishment negative reinforcement you can kind of see again how all of this works together right so again take some time with this really absorb it really think about what these terms mean okay so let's look at an example so tina made her bed when she woke up um her brother got up got into the shower first and used up all the hot water so she made her bed and then her brother got up and used up all the hot water um what is that an example of is that positive reinforcement negative reinforcement present presentation punishment um negative punishment and what is tony what is tina gonna do the next day yeah, it's negative punishment, right? So she did not get her hot shower, so it's a negative, right? But she's probably not going to take a shower the next day, right? Okay, so her mother says, wow, Tina, I'm so proud of you. You made the bed this morning, that's great. So what's what's she gonna do next tomorrow? Yeah, she's probably gonna take a shower tomorrow, right? Or she's probably gonna, I'm sorry, she's probably gonna make her bed again, right? So that means it's increasing the behavior. So that is a, that is a reinforcer, right? And did her mother do something or take something away? She did something, right? So it's a positive reinforcement, right? Very good. Okay. Her mother said, Tina, since you made your bed this morning, you will not have to clear the table at tonight at dinner. So is that a reinforcement or a punishment? Good. And is it positive or negative? Excellent, that should have been a negative reinforcement. She's going to increase, she's going to make her bed again, and her mother took something away, having to clear the table. And finally, her mother says, you goody two-shoes loser, now mom's gonna be after me, and proceeded to administer several painful nuggies to Tina's arm. So is that a punishment or a reinforcement? And was it positive or negative? Right, it's a punishment. She's not gonna wanna do, she's not gonna make her bed again. And it was something that her brother did, so it's presentation. Good. Okay. Here's another example. Tyrone finished all his homework on Friday. The first example, so his mom said that they wouldn't have to go to the library this weekend. And Tyrone loves the library. So is that a punishment or a reinforcement? So what's he gonna do next week? Is it, is it negative or positive? It's a negative punishment, right? He's not gonna go to the library. He's not gonna wanna do his homework next week and his mother took something away. His mom took him fishing, fishing on Sunday afternoon since Tyro, Tyrone's homework was done and Tyrone loves fishing. Is that a punishment or a reinforcement? And is it positive or negative? Excellent, it's a positive reinforcement. His mom said, good, now you can start working on the next chapter of math book to get ahead of, ahead of everyone else. And Tyrone hates math. So is that punishment or reinforcement? And is it positive or negative? That it's a positive punishment. He is not gonna encourage him to do it again. He's gonna decrease the behavior and it's something that she did too, it's something she added. Finally, at the end of the weekend, he felt good and realized that his mom had nagged him once all weekend. Is that reinforcement or punishment? And is it positive or negative? Good, it was, a, it was an reinforcement and it's negative, right? Because she didn't do something, she took something away, the nagging, right? So hopefully these examples also helped you clarify the differences between positive and negative and punishment and reinforcement. And again, this just takes practice to get these terms down. Um, I think that we all kind of understand positive reinforcement, we all understand punishment. It's the negative punishment and the negative reinforcement that I think get a little tricky for us. So 
What's important to think about with operant conditioning is that reinforcement is the key here, that really in, in true operant conditioning, we're really thinking that we can change behavior through reinforcement exclusively, through rewards. And it's um, the reinforcement of desired behaviors is the ideal way. Punishment can stop a behavior, but it doesn't tell us what to do instead. So I can stop a kid from um, running, but I don't necessarily tell, replace that with a, with a behavior. So if we think about classroom management, if we think about learning and instruction, which is what this class is all about, we really want to focus on that reinforcement about telling, showing kids what they should do rather than just taking away what they shouldn't do. And then there's a really good example about adding here, if they, if they get the wrong answer and we tell them they're wrong, we haven't really replaced that with how to do it correctly. Um, and then the other thing to think about is um, how do we reinforce this behavior through reinforcement schedules? So do we have to give a reward every single time? Um, because that can lead to satiation and to um, really expensive budgets for candy, right? I can't afford to give each of you a piece of candy every single time you answer a piece of answer a question, right? So let's look at reward schedules. So what we see is um, the different schedules. The first one's continuous, and that means that I give a reinforcement after every single response. So every single time you get a question right, I give you a piece of candy. What happens is that there's little persistence, that um, rapidly you just stop caring about the candy. You get full, your stomach hurts, and you're like, wow, I've had way too much candy. Or you start wanting bigger and bigger rewards. So suddenly, one piece of candy is not enough, you know, now I've started giving you a whole chocolate bar and then suddenly it's like a pizza party and suddenly I have no more money because I'm only a teacher, right? So continuous reinforcement at least to satiation very quickly that I just cannot give enough rewards. So the next one is fixed interval and this is about time. So I get reinforcement after a set period of time. So um, if I, um, that, um, if you answer questions correctly, and if you've answered a question correctly within the first, within five minutes, then you get a piece of candy. What happens here is that again, um, that there's a little persistence that um, if I, if after five minutes, I don't give you a piece of candy, then you just kind of stop doing it. So there's no, it doesn't last over time. Um, um, variable interval means that I give reinforcement after varying lengths of time. So sometimes I give it after one minute, sometimes I give it after five minutes, sometimes it's 10 minutes, and it just varies over, it varies. Um, that gives greater persistence. Um, so, because if you don't know when it's coming, you're maybe more likely. Um, fixed ratio means that I give a reinforcement after a set number of responses rather than a set number of times. So. And after every five correct answers, I give you a piece of candy. And again, what happens is that if I don't give that after I stop giving the candy, you stop answering. Um, a variable ratio means that it did, that sometimes I give it after one answer, sometimes five, sometimes ten, and um, the response rate stays high um, after over a longer period of time. So that, um, and this is kind of like gambling is like, right? That sometimes you get rewards, sometimes you don't, and you don't really know when that reward's coming and that keeps people coming back to the slot machine, right? Um, and again, there's a really nice discussion of this in the um, Watson video um, on the Canvas site. Our guiding questions here was what constructs this behavior is going to So I hope that you can talk about operating classical conditioning. You can talk about schedules of responses, positive and negative reinforcement and punishments. You can talk about conditioned and um, stimuli and unconditioned stimuli and responses um, and the things that we've discussed this um, week. And that you can also talk about how those things are related to each other. So this was um, a good class. I hope that you guys understand these concepts. And if you don't, please reach out to me. I am here in my office. I'm happy to talk with you on the phone, to meet with you in my office. I want to make sure that you really understand the concepts of this course. And I'm here to help you. So have a great day, guys. Goodbye.